from the European Parliament here in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us, and this is what we have for you on the program. Populist flop, who showed up and who didn't at a far-right meeting intended to unite the right. Last-minute sell, Theresa May jets off to Paris and Berlin ahead of an emergency Brexit summit. Great debate, France unveils the results of a nationwide listening tour aimed at quelling protests. Libya lawlessness, what a power struggle could mean for regional stability and for Europe. And royal internship, Prince William gets some one-on-one -on -one time with Britain's top spies. All right, it is time to meet our panelists this evening. We start with Darren McCaffrey, our political editor at Your News. Darren, which of these stories are you watching? Uh, well, it has to be Brexit, doesn't it, uh, Tessa? <laughs> it and there is a, almost an irony in all of this for a process that was made about taking back control uh, to Britain and its parliament. Uh, they've now essentially given control away in the next part of this process uh, to places like Paris and uh, Berlin. I think she'll get a pretty warm reception uh, in Germany from the German Chancellor, uh, though it might be a little bit frostier, the Lisi Palace in Paris. All right, and Theresa May on last-minute trip there. All right, joining us uh, as well is Gerolf Annemans. He is a Belgian MEP with the Europe of Nations and Freedom Group. What about you? Which, what, what are you watching? What story? The first story, although the title is a bit manipulated, it's not a flop, it's the first step in, uh, in the building up of our group. Okay, we'll talk about what you think about uh, that populist uh, meeting there. All right, and also joining us, Indrek Torrent. He's an Estonian MEP with the Greens EFA party. What about you, Indrek? I watch all the stories, but uh, of course Milan is a fashion capital, so... Ah, is that I why? I keep an eye back. <laughs> okay, but we well, will. With a, ja with a jacket like that. Um, <laughs> and that's exactly where statement. we're starting. We're going to Milan because uh, Matteo Salvini is actually there talking about his new European dream. Italy's deputy prime minister kicked off his campaign for the European elections in Milan today by meeting with other populist parties in Europe. Well, that summit brought together the far-right League Party, Germany's AFD, the conservative Finns Party, and the Danish People's Party. Well, Mr. Salvini says that they are planning to forge an alliance of European right-wing parties. La notizia è che stiamo allargando la comunità, la famiglia. Stiamo lavorando per un nuovo sogno europeo. Oggi per molti cittadini e molti popoli l'Unione Europea rappresenta un incubo, non un sogno. Noi stiamo lavorando per riportare al centro il lavoro, la famiglia, la sicurezza la tutela dell'ambiente, il futuro dei giovani. Lo facciamo con movimenti che sono alternativi a chi ha comandato in Europa in questi decenni. Ovviamente l'accordo fra democristiani e socialisti ci ha portato in questa situazione di povertà, di incertezza, di litigio e di insicurezza. E quindi è un'alleanza che guarda al futuro. All right, uh, our Rome uh, correspondent, Georgia Orlandi, was at that conference and she joins us now live from Milan. Georgia, so uh, do you think, uh, after seeing what you see, heard what you heard today, will this new alliance actually work? Well, Tessa, as you mentioned, Salvini organized this gathering of right-wing parties, uh, nationalists, uh, in order to uh, build a new alliance, but also uh, to really launch his European elections campaign. Salvini has been talking uh, to a number uh, of a party across the continent. This was uh, an open invitation to all of them. He's been talking to some members of the EPP party, to Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban, uh, to the PIS uh, in uh, Poland. But to Today also was the chance for him to launch his pan-European nationalist manifesto for what he called Europe's party of common sense, with a great focus on Europe, but mainly on the people of Europe who are really at the center of his political message in order really to give the power back to the people and fulfill this, what he called the European dream. But the question is really whether this coalition will work. We know that immigration really is the common ground here. There are lots of other issues that are very much dividing, like economic policies, relations with Russia. I spoke earlier with Anders Vistiser, who's an MEP for the Danish People Party, and this is what he had to say. 
there is diverting uh, interest in all political groups in the European Parliament. The difference is that our political movement built on the respect for the uh, member states and therefore we respect the differences instead of trying to see one size fits all policy. So for instance we don't want a common foreign affairs policy. We want to respect that the Italians can have their version and the Finns can have their version and the Danes can have their version. So that is one of the great achievements, possible achievements of this new initiative that is to respect the differences and especially on policy areas where there is not much European uh, uh, coordination needed or, or, or even uh, um, uh, from my point of view it would be a disaster for instance to have a foreign uh, a common foreign policy of Europe well the Danish People Party was one of the few parties that really attended this meeting together with Alternative for Germany and uh, the Fiends party now the second question is whether the absence of key uh, political figures does speak to the political differences between all these parties Tessa yeah, indeed, that is the question because sometimes, you know, the stronger message is what was not said. So in this case, those that weren't actually there. So what is the, the kind of message that we see from uh, the people who actually were not at that conference? Well, Tessa, there's been a huge debate here in Italy in the last days over who had been officially invited to uh, this meeting, who had and who was going to attend and who was not going to attend. As we know, Orban wasn't here, Le Pen wasn't here, Strache wasn't here. Now, Salvini provided quite an interesting explanation last week in Paris where he attended G7. He said that this is not a question of any invitation at all being turned down. This is a question of the fact that, well, the fact that they were not here is simply due to the fact that they were not on the gas. Least. So no big deal. This is uh, according to Salvini. Well, if this is true or not, we have to wait for the next European elections results. Tessa. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Georgia Orlandi. And in fact, uh, Salvini did meet uh, Marine Le Pen in, in Paris last week on Friday. I, I'll go to you first, Gerolf, because you, you talked about this when we were introducing the story. Populist flop question mark. You don't think it was a flop, even if there were, what, four parties that well, were there? Let, let it be clear that Salvini represented all his friends of the group he is in now. The Lega is part of the ENF group and the ENF group is together in these elections. And the only thing that, that happened today in Milan was that he was presenting as one of our big or most important leaders was presenting the enlargement of our group in the next, uh, in the next few years. Uh, with the Danish, with the Finns, with the uh, Yeah, but there were notable uh, the absences. Germans. Viktor Orban, yeah, you have but the PIS. There, there was no inviting Pen. list. He decided and we decided to uh, enlarge our, uh, our, our movement with important parties. And that was the news. And the news was not that the others were not there. We were there uh, in mind because uh, we consider Salvini as one of our representatives. OK, watching this from the outside, I'll ask you, Andrak, what, do you, what message is it sending to you when you watch, OK, these are there four parties there, some who were, weren't? Well, the message is very simple. In the rules of the European Parliament, we need at least seven countries to form a political group. So if they fail to do that, and I've been privileged... So you think it's a flop? Uh, well, it's a failure. <laughs> no, no. But, uh, <laughs> but I've, been privileged, I've been privileged to watch yes. these activities on that uh, political spectrum for many years. Farage cannot cooperate with Marine Le Pen because uh, he considers... Front National too anti-Semitic and vice versa, and the Polish cannot cooperate with the Dutch and so on, and if they finally can form something, they quarrel about abortion. Mm. Some want to ban yeah, it, sorry. the others not, so it's a, I'm sorry. It's a nice try. Okay, but, jump no, in, before I go to Darren, jump uh, in. The ENF group is an established group of, in the European Parliament, it and is. it's enlarging now. That is the news. The news is not the ENF, ENF was but appearing in But there is a Milan point that there are issues, for, sticking points that they, they don't yeah, see eye to eye. Every group has issues. For instance, the EPP but has issues, issues with, issues. with, uh, with uh, Hungary, very fundamental issues. Groups in the European Parliament are not a block, are not blocks. Eh? They have different views. That's our message also to the European Union. Permit different views, also in groups. So, but the ENF group is not disappearing. But the is, it, is it possible? Is okay. enlarging. Is it possible really to unite the right, given these well, issues? I, I mean, Gerolf is saying... It, I mean, there is a, 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 more than a strong hint of irony in obviously what this group and indeed kind of 
populist parties want or people who want a different type of Europe. There's a very easy solution that if Europe is facing a common problem, mm. many Europeans will suggest that the issue and the way to deal with this is a common European narrative. Uh, the kind of intrinsic difficulty is if you represent a disparate group of different parties from different countries who recognise at least a common problem, but then insist that the solution should down, be then down to all the different individuals, well, then trying to actually have a commonality and power consensus, policy yeah. on consensus on that is incredibly difficult. So, well, so you all recognise that migration, unless, immigration... No, no, but all recognise that immigration is an issue in Europe, but the way that uh, the, the various populists want to deal with it are completely with odds with each other. Of course. It, that's, Italy, that's for our example, to... wants a very different solution, yeah. a more European solution apart, than... Apart from the fact that we all agree, and that is our point, actually, our mission here in the European Parliament is to voice the fact that the way the European Union deals with it in a unilateral and, 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 and a centralised way is not the way they should deal with it. That can unite us, this message. What, 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 about, what about the... the and, and people have been looking at this and saying that actually what Salvini is trying to do here is he's less really concerned about the European elections. Mm. He's less concerned about this political grouping. What he's trying to demonstrate is that in his base in Italy, that he is the leader and is the core of the kind of anti-capitalist, anti-European movement as it is currently. And yeah. that this is much as more about domestic Italian politics yeah. than yeah. it is about European yeah. we, politics. We all okay, are so in domestic politics let, during these elections. Yeah, Indra, oh. jump in. Well, when, when, you, when you look at this, is, is this a threat? Because the projections are showing that, you know, far-right populist nationalist parties would make gains in the upcoming election. Yeah, Do you they, feel the threat? I don't feel a threat, uh, because if uh, in democracy people have a, a right to be stupid and vote for or sort of extremist uh, approaches, destructive, disruptional approaches, they have a right to it. What I say is that it, the parliament will be rhetorically more interesting because all kind of colourful people will be elected, but they won't construct anything. They will make a lot of noise, like Nigel has but been this, But this will doing. make... Well, Exactly. Uh, exactly. Well, that's, we have Brexit, so, and yeah. he has been calling for We that don't for... have it yet. OK, <sighs> but it is on the table. I'm saying that the, even if you say colourful people are there, yeah. it will be part of the debate, it will be part of the yeah. discussion, and it's it will good. be part of consensus uh, as building. As long as it's democratic, d debate based on rules, it's OK. They yeah. have their uh -huh. argument, and I have mine. As soon as somebody proper, uh, starts to promote violence, mm. some kind of uh, violent takeovers, anti-constitutional movements, we will have to... Look I don't know our, about our Estonia, thing. but uh, none of the parties of ENF are promoting violence whatsoever or violent takeovers. Uh, and none of our electorate is stupid. The people that vote for us are not stupid. On the contrary, they are very smart. They see that the European Union evolves in a way that is not wishful and that uh, they should have another kind of European cooperation mm. and just putting that on the table cannot be stupid on the contrary this is a smart idea because if we go on with the bulldozer of the European Union mm. we will crush European I cooperation. Think very, just very quickly before we go it's just what's interesting is that you have Viktor Orban who's flirting with that with idea sitting on the fence basically and you have the Polish PIS just flirting with idea but not really just seeing where they would be more uh, powerful let's no, say. And, and, and I think and people, the are, people party are, or, are keeping the powder dry uh, sure. uh, to use a phrase <laughs> sure. uh, to, 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 to see what happens of course during the election and see how the results pan out in terms of uh, which party gets which. No, absolutely. All right, let's move on, because there are other things uh, on the election radar now, because Matteo Salvini, he's not the only one, clearly, with the eye on the elections, we all are watching it. Here's today's ballot buzz with a roundup of all the day's election news, including one burgeoning bromance. Let's take a look. On the march, Hungary's Viktor Orban is on an election footing. He's framing the European Parliament vote as a choice between pro- and anti-immigration leaders. Launching his campaign, he presented a seven-point plan. On Mr. Orban's shopping list, migration management should be taken away from Brussels bureaucrats, countries shouldn't have to accept migrants against their will, and no one should be allowed into Europe without valid identification. Meanwhile, in Lower Bavaria, a bromance is brewing. Manfred Weber, the EPP's candidate to replace Jean-Claude Juncker, was joined on the campaign trail by Austria's Chancellor Sebastian Kurz. After their embrace, Mr. Kurz took to Facebook, describing the EPP chief as a staunch European who promotes necessary changes in the EU. 
And over in Estonia, Prime Minister Juri Ratas looks set to hold on to power after a three-way coalition agreement was sealed, including the far-right EKRE group, which opposes same-sex civil unions and mandatory EU refugee quotas. It's a deal which will be watched closely in Brussels as the countdown to the European Parliament election continues. All right, I mean, we saw there in Estonia, we're looking at, uh, you know, the first time a far-right party is going to be in a coalition. I mean, this is the trend that we're, we're seeing, huh? Well, is what we're seeing across Europe is kind of the fracturization of politics um, and that all sorts of parties are having to team up uh, with minor parties in order to try and form coalitions because it's the only form that uh, government would be viable uh, under. Mm. Uh, but being no doubt, I mean, it's not just... I mean, there is a tendency to focus on when it is necessarily the far right, but you're also seeing this with a whole spectrum of parties, whether it's the Greens... The Greens as well. Or ...whether it's kind of um, socialist parties on the left. So, it, 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 and again, it's also not necessarily a new phenomenon. What is new is simply that, you know, politics is incredibly fractured at the moment. No, indeed. Uh, it, but... Well, that's not that new. It's it's, it's happening for 30 years in, uh, that, that opposition parties or parties that oppose the uh, system from before, that they are called fractionar, fra fractionizing the system. Mm. That is not the case. They are opposing the system. Uh, all in the beginning no, not, with a smaller party. I'm not using it. Sorry, I'm not using it. They end up in government. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not using it's the word. Normal. It's democracy. No, no, I'm not saying. I'm not using the word fraction as, as a bad thing. No, no, okay. no. I'm, I'm, but I'm it's not, just sorry, a different. No, different, sorry, different, different. Sorry, I'm not saying it's a negative term. But, but, but let's, uh, bring the, let's bring the, the Greens part of it because you're right. Because the Greens are also you know, banding together and trying to make headway into the European Parliament. Yeah. And right they are because the only valid worldview on 21st century is environmentalism. The others are 19th century. But uh, speaking about extremes, and I don't like this right or left thing uh, division. It's some kind of French revolutionary parliament seating based. It doesn't make sense. The thing is, either you are constructive and rule-based, a Democrat, or you are a Bolshevik fascist or Nazi who defies the rules and creates a totalitarian system. Uh, by using the weaknesses or, or flops of democratic oh. system. So that is the danger well, I see. Well, that's a description you're... you probably won't well, uh, I'm not a Bolshevik. <laughs> I was uh, an anti-communist when sure. I was 17 years old. <laughs> Me so too. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> well, uh, something feeling in common uh, what, he, what he says. But basically, uh, try to... Th th that is the European election of 27... Uh, 26th May of May is actually will the centre prevail mm. or will the centre have to deal with other parties, left or and right, so-called left to or so-called right? And that is the question. Mm. And if you want to question the system of the centre, please vote for one of this. All right. OK, let's leave it at that. Uh, we have a lot more coming up for you. Now, migration, this is a, clearly a major issue in the upcoming election, but it isn't the only issue. We have uh, Libya now, which is making uh, a lot of headlines. It's a major departure point for those hoping to reach Europe all those uh, the, the refugees that we're seeing in the migration crisis. But the unrest there tonight is making a lot of people nervous. Now, rebel forces led by Khalifa Haftar are continuing their push to take the capital city of Tripoli. The country's Prime Minister, Fayez al Sarraj has accused Haftar of planning a coup. Well, several people are reported to have died amid the surge in violence. The United Nations says that more than 2,000 people have been displaced by clashes and many more could flee. Now, the EU's uh, Foreign Affairs Chief, Federica Mogherini, she is called for a humanitarian truce. I think the first message we need to pass united uh, is uh, full implementation uh, of the humanitarian truce uh, to allow the civilians and the wounded to be evacuated from uh, um, uh, the city and to avoid any further military action and any further military escalation and the return to the political negotiations uh, and the political track. Yeah, so there, I, you know, we, when we heard that, and there is also worries from some quarters that this bloodshed could trigger a new refugee exodus from from Libya, from the region. Yeah, and of course that has to be a concern. Um, and the European Union has worked very closely with the current administration in uh, Libya to try and stem the flow um, but of how migration. How do you do that when, when, when there is violence? Well, of course, of course, and sure. um, it, it's it's not very clear how this is going to pan out over the next couple of weeks. Um, but be in no doubt that clearly what Europe cannot in some ways or would want to afford in the run-up to an election is potentially <clears throat> uh, the start of another refugee crisis. Uh, sure. But also, you know, this is a very uncomfortable position because Libya is and 
is a filled state. Mm. Um, and in many regards, the European Union at the moment is facilitating things in Libya that many Europeans would think unacceptable when it comes to migration. But that, that's where we find There's ourselves. Another, uh, and coupled with Algeria, sure. you know, there are real concerns about what's happening I mean, yet this again is, This is uh, yeah, an issue that could explode in, in another way, and we're clearly watching that closely. All right, coming up uh, more on uh, raw politics, last-ditch lobbying. Theresa May sneaks in visits to EU leaders before Wednesday's emergency Brexit summit. Plus, going undercover, why Prince William did a three-week internship at Britain's top spy agencies. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, Theresa May is packing her bags and preparing for a last-ditch European road trip to save her Brexit deal again. Well, she's meeting Angela Merkel in Berlin and Emmanuel Macron in Paris tomorrow to make her case one final time ahead of Wednesday's Crunch Summit. Meanwhile, Chief Brexit Negotiator Michel Barnier was on a road trip of his own, visiting Dublin to meet Irish leader Leo Varadkar. Now, fears of a disorderly Brexit are very real in Ireland, the only EU member that shares a land border with the UK. Now, the UK's Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, told foreign ministers in Luxembourg this morning that the UK still hasn't given up on finding a Brexit solution. What I think I'll be saying to my colleagues in the European Union today is that you can see from this that Theresa May is leaving no stone unturned to try and resolve Brexit. They want Brexit to be resolved as quickly as possible. So do we, so do the British people, so do MPs, and so we are doing absolutely everything we can to try and get a resolution to get Brexit over the line. OK, so let us now cross live to our correspondent, Vincent McAvinney, in London for us. Vincent, is there any uh, progress on those uh, cross-party negotiations today? Good evening, Tessa. Well, the negotiations still seem to be stalled. On Friday, the Labour Party came out with a statement very critical of the government, saying that they hadn't really shifted their position enough and they wanted to talk about the future political declaration because, of course, they're worried that Theresa May could be replaced by another leader, someone like Boris Johnson or Michael Gove, a much harder Brexiteer, and they want to put in some kind of binding lock on the next prime minister. So, at the moment, those discussions aren't taking place. There is rumour that there could be some pick-up later if the government changes its offer to the Labour Party. But at the moment, this is what their shadow Brexit secretary, Sir Keir Starmer, had to say. Well, at the moment, um, we haven't seen a change of position from the government. If there is a change of position, we need to consider that, and we will consider it. Um, so we'll have to see what happens today. But I think uh, what I can say is both sides, both us and the government, have approached this in the spirit of trying to find a way forward. We haven't found that yet. We'll continue to do so. All right. And uh, as if she hasn't had enough, uh, Theresa May had more bad news uh, from her own backbenchers today, didn't she? That's right. Some of our backbenchers obviously very enraged that the Prime Minister is now having these talks with Jeremy Corbyn, someone that they particularly don't like. And these are the people in the ERG, the so-called Spartans, who are hoping that the UK leaves with no deal. That's what they want to happen at the end of this week. And one of those, Marc Francois, has really written quite a punchy letter. He has uh, said that the Prime Minister has been a failure to leader, as a leader of the party. She now threatens to destroy it. And it's a classic example of who hubris and after hubris comes nemesis. So some quite uh, uh, sort of strong words against the prime minister. He is calling for the party to have what he's calling an indicative vote on her leadership. Now, of course, the 1922 committee did have a vote on the prime minister back in December. She won that confidence vote and now can stay in place until December. This is something that Marc Francois was pushing last week. I took him up on this saying you simply can't do this, but he seems to think that the party can do. He's someone who's becoming increasingly vocal in this letter, which sort of rambles on really for three pages, he really gives a full-blooded attack of the Prime Minister. I'm not sure it's going to do much uh, to help the cause of the ERG. He is pushing very hard for the Prime Minister to simply leave with no deal on Friday. And we'll see over the next few days whether the Prime Minister, if she does manage to get any kind of agreement with the Labour Party, can get enough support from her MPs or if having Jeremy Corbyn's support really is the death knell for it.
All right, thank you for that, uh, Vincent McAvinny, our correspondent there. And back with me in the studio is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. You also have uh, Sajd Karim, a British Conservative MEP who sits with the European Conservatives and Reformist Group in the Parliament, and Martina Anderson. She's an Irish Sinn Féin MEP who sits with the European United Left Group. All right, let's uh, talk about Theresa May's so last minute, uh, trying to get support from, from Paris and Berlin. What do you make of that, Sajd? Is she, is she, is she going to go get anything out of this? Well, it's, it's the same strategy that existed right at the outset, which was to reach out to the capitals rather than to engage with Brussels. That's failed miserably so far. Uh, the very most that can really happen in all of this is that, um, you know, Donald Tusk has set out the position as it is. Um, uh, and there really is a hope that maybe some of the larger member states can persuade some of the smaller ones mm. not to take some drastic actions that put the UK in a corner. But when France itself is actually saying, no, we are minded to veto the granting of an extension, it's very difficult to see what is to be gained from that sort of engagement. Yeah, and, and I think uh, what Emmanuel Macron was saying, that oh, he doesn't have, really have any appetite uh, to, to extend that, that Article 50 extension. You have, you know, Ireland uh, thinking, well, this is going to impact us, right? And Mr. Michel Barnier being there talking to Leo Varadkar, what are the main concerns there, considering everything that is going on? Well, the president and vice president of Sinn Féin met with Michel Barnier last week, and myself and Matt Carthy will be meeting with him on Wednesday. And we're deeply concerned because we have been warning people throughout this entire process that in the context of a crash, then Ireland is going to be used as collateral damage. And whatever way this all falls, you know, there's potential of physical infrastructure, not just in the border partition in Ireland, because WTO rules will necessitate it there. But we've been told, well, maybe it will be away from the border. And if anybody has any notion that people in Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal is going to tolerate an economic border being imposed by 26 member states, I think they should think again. So people are deeply concerned in Ireland about the implications that this is going to have for our country mm -hmm. and also for our peace and political agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, sure. 21 years ago on the 19th of this month, so, but, our, it's, you know, was lodged at the United Nations. Yeah, and if we look at, though, the direction of where all this is going, do you think, Darren, I'll ask you, talking to, to everybody here in Brussels, do you think that the direction is really going for the, to the extension of Article 50, regardless of what's being said yeah, I mean, in the, public? The, 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 there will be an extension. The question sure. is, uh, how Up long when, for? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I mean, Emmanuel Macron, even though I'd love to, uh, he'd love to think that he might be a uh, Charles de Gaulle, is not going to say <laughs> uh, no to the British on this. Sure. I mean, for a whole wide right, range of reasons, not least of all because Ireland is definitely mm. not prepared for a no-deal uh, Brexit. Uh, you know, when Angela Merkel was there at the end of last week, when she was asked, how are you going to kind of get a solution to this problem of protecting the integrity of the single market and keeping the, or the border free, uh, what, eight days out, the response was, well, whether the, when, when there's a will, there's a way. Mm. So clearly they're not there yet on that. And no one, not even France, will want to potentially cause economic havoc in the run-up to European elections. So, yes, there will be an extension. Um, what they would expect from Theresa May, and I think what Emmanuel Macron particularly tomorrow, but also uh, Angela Merkel is, but for what cause? Mm. Can you set out a roadmap which shows that there is at least light at the end of this tunnel or an end to kicking the can so down does the that, is that where the cross-party agreement comes in? Where If there's something new that can be brought to the table? I'll ask you that, Saj. Yes, it is, because... Um, it, it may be that the parties can't come to an agreement yet, but what they can agree on is a pathway forward. For mm. instance, that if we do come to an agreement, we will put it uh, in a referendum to the people. That may be enough and sufficient to get an extension of whatever length in place. Uh, I think that is going to be the way forward. I, I think there is a need for calmer heads to prevail. Uh, much of the um, pushing towards the extremes that's taking place in London mm. is being done for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have people like Jacob Rees-Mogg putting out the sorts of provocative tweets that they are putting out. That's why you've got Marc Francois doing what he's doing at the moment. But there is a need for the grown-ups to remain in charge. I mean, I know that the crash out is, is a big fear in Ireland, but it seems like when we talk about the options in Brexit, it seems like a race, like one week this, this, one week it's leading that. Are we talking now about the customs union, the idea being leading? So meaning the, the concept of a crash out is less likely now? Well, what we are facing at this moment in time as we sit here is nothing other than a crash out. But hopefully on Wednesday, if there's going to be a resolution put forward that actually doesn't just give an extension for more chaos and more uncertainty, but as Europe has been saying, well, why not an extension, but what for? 
And we as a party were preparing for European elections. Mm. Um, I think that is happening uh, across the board with lots of parties looking at going into a European election that people thought we weren't going to be fighting for. But that said, the people of the north of Ireland should always be voting for European elections. It's absolutely unacceptable that people from Spain and Italy and France and Germany who reside in the north of Ireland would have been able to vote in the European Parliament elections and those of us from the north of Ireland who are Irish could not. Yeah. You know, the farcical sort of outworkings of all of this has done untold damage and even people in the north of Ireland are, ref are receiving green cards from yep. the insurance company to tell us that we will need green cards to travel in our own country across the border. Yeah, so the last point on this is what Martina brought up is the fact that they're preparing now, even those who are probably expected to be out of the European Union or I think Brexit to happen, now they have to prepare in the event of an extension for the European Parliament elections. I mean, how does this play out, Darren? Yeah, they are, <laughs> and, and I think uh, almost certainly Theresa May is going to commit, that, uh, commit to that this week. Uh, they will spend tens of millions of pounds on it. I think there's still a hope in London, though it's pretty Small, that will make some people uh, really that, angry, wouldn't it? I well, mean, it, it will, definitely, yeah. and, and, and we may well see those elections turn into a de facto referendum, actually, mm -hmm. uh, which could see very great polarisation of views in Britain. Um, but Theresa May's slim hope is that somehow, over the next couple of weeks, her and Jeremy Corbyn do agree, essentially, on a type of customs uh, union, and it does get through Parliament, mm -hmm. and that at the last minute she can cancel those elections, whether it be, you know, on mm -hmm. the 22nd of May, the day before, uh, that's still a slim hope. I think, in reality, though, they are going to have to fight them. And you're right, a lot of people will be angry that we are well over a 1,000 days since Britain voted to leave the European Union, mm -hmm. and right at this moment in time, it's now looking at a prospect where Britain could potentially still be in for at least another year. But if you're can, a Leave, just, vote, okay, you're a leave the voter in the can, UK, can, you're pretty can, angry. Can okay, I'll give you a last word. Yeah. Custom Union does not prevent physical infrastructure it doesn't on solve the border. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. So it doesn't whatever they agree in Britain, that is not going to deal with the mm. issue of the backstop, which was sure. the least worst option for us. So it doesn't deal sure. it does, with so regulatory It does help a lot, though. It does help a lot. It doesn't help us one iota, not at all. Well, we have to move on uh, from Brexit for now, but certainly something we'll be watching till Wednesday, that is, with so much going on behind the scenes now. Theresa May could really do with an insider. Well, she could always look to the royal household as Prince William. He has just finished interning with the spy services. Let's take a look. He may already look the part and have the charm, but now Prince William really is Britain's 007. Channeling on-screen legend James Bond, the royal spent the past three weeks interning with the UK's intelligence services. The top-secret news was revealed on Instagram with this snap from Kensington Palace. According to the royal household, he started off here at MI6, then worked on counter-terror with MI5 and ended the placement at Tech Hub GCHQ. Mission accomplished. The Duke of Cambridge said it was an incredible opportunity and commended all those who work there. What do you make of that, Sarge? A royal spy? Well, I'm glad he enjoyed Turning. the last few weeks shadowing me around the European Parliament. No, I, 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 I joke, of course. We knew that, Sarge. <laughs> no, I think it's great because, um, you know, uh, our younger royals have been absolutely fantastic in connecting with the public at large. So it's good to see him hands-on getting stuck in there and actually mm. coming out at the end of it, you know, saying, look, I've learned it's so much. It's actually a tough job. <laughs> yeah, you know, th this is really tough. And, and we've got, you know, real people doing these jobs day in, day out, facing these challenges. So I think it's a great thing. Did he get a double you O, o seven, I know. Double I was thinking o that. Is he the new <laughs> double used to o. lunch every day in the canteen as well. Did he? Yeah? Just to portray oh, himself right. as a man of the people. That, that, okay. that, that's where I was every day. <laughs> yeah. ah, now we know, Saj. Okay, coming up on Rome Politics, what are French citizens' biggest grievances? After two months of nationwide debates, the French government has the answers, but will the LFS protesters be satisfied? That's next.
Welcome back. Now, French officials have had a busy two months. According to their own figures, they've held over 10,000 town hall meetings and received almost 2 million online messages as part of the grand debate. President Macron's response to the Yellow Vest protest. Well, high taxes were perhaps unsurprisingly a key concern. As according to uh, French Prime Minister Edouard Philippe, the Gilets Jaunes protests have now been going on for 21 consecutive weeks in Paris and across France. And let's hear how some of the findings were presented earlier today. Nous avons baissé les cotisations sociales, baissé la taxe d'habitation, baissé l'impôt sur les sociétés, sans doute pas assez vite, sans doute pas assez fortement, sans doute pas assez clairement, car manifestement cela n'a pas suffi à répondre au ras-le-bol. Notre pays a atteint aujourd'hui une sorte de tolérance fiscale zéro, je ne sais pas si on peut l'appeler comme ça, mais c'est souvent comme ça qu'elle est exprimée. Les débats je le crois, nous indique clairement la direction à prendre. Nous devons baisser et baisser plus vite les impôts. Now, joining me to discuss this in the studio is Esther Zalan, a reporter with EU Observer. We also have Thibaut Jacobs, a public relations and communication strategist at Fleischmann Hillard. And still with us is EU News a political editor, Darren McCaffrey. All right, um, I'll start with you, Thibaut, because when we saw that uh, Edouard Philippe was speaking there, is this, um, you know, some, would, some have criticized the Grand Débat and his government as Macron's government as disingenuous. It wasn't sincere. So when we look at that, was that a PR stunt? Well, that's... Everything will be decided now, and the success of the initiative will be based on that. But I think we'll have to see that in, next, in the next two months, and not just right now. People want to see if this is just about comms, indeed, or if measures will actually be implemented. I mean, when he says, oh, we've lowered taxes, we've lowered taxes, is that going to make people happy? Is that something people want to hear? That's what people want to hear and to see in their daily life on mm. their on their pay slips every day, definitely. And this is something that came from the yellow vest crisis, but also from the grand debate. So you had two things to look at, and that was the consensus mm. there. People want to see that, and they've done a lot, to be fair to them, over the last two years. Probably more than what uh, Sarkozy and Hollande did in terms of um, spending power. But, but, but if, if it's lower taxes, that then also mean less spending on public services, and, exactly, and they're cutting public security. spending as well. But there you go. the Guardian notes. How are they going to find the right balance between both? Because people want to see both, definitely. Less, less taxes, but they also want to see more public service and across the, the, the territory, not just in towns. That's another mm. big thing. Mm. People want in the countryside to see that they still have train tracks, they still have the post office, they still have public service. Mm. And just looking at this from a reporter, okay, covering, covering the, the whole con debat, was this a real listening tour? Because there were critics that say, well, you know, he invited the people that he wanted or these Gilets jaunes said, well, if you genuinely believe in this movement, do not go to those. Uh, Gantt Bat, is it legitimate? Can we say they learned uh, something legitimate from this? I mean, they obviously learned something, which is lower taxes and, and very quickly, I think, which is definitely going to be a challenge. And I think uh, what's, in, what's interesting here that is Macron did go into the public and, and, and spent at times seven, eight, nine hours straight talking to people, while on the other hand, you know, populists always say that we need to, t or politicians need to listen to, to the people, to the public better. And I think this is what exactly what Macron has done. Will it change the perception of Macron? Mm. We, will, we don't know yet. Mm. Uh, but I think it's, he made an effort, at least, even if if he came across as abrasive or arrogant sometimes in these it's very debates. It's all about debates. perception, isn't yeah. it? But as yeah. you were bringing up a taxes, Darren, earlier, but the wealth tax, the one that people actually wanted back, it isn't coming back, isn't well, it? Well, and, and, that, and that's a problem. I think that's but interesting. This is a been, perennial been the battle basically. for politicians, it must be said, not just in France, but across the world. Yeah. It's just unsurprisingly people want to pay less tax, but they still want their great public uh, services. I think for Macron, uh, I mean, from, from what I can see, this has been so far a success. I mean, he has turned around what was a pretty dire situation uh, for him, like a genuinely proper crisis for the presidency at the end of last year. Now, you're right, it is too soon to yeah. tell uh, whether, you know, this will be a long-term beneficial aim. But you know what, in terms of actually kind of judging things as a crisis management mm. in terms of politics, you know, there are many other political leaders around Europe who could watch what has happened and learn an awful lot because, you know, Omar should back up in the polls, uh, his personal approval ratings, OK, they're not near the high they were, but they're at least going in the right direction mm. uh, now. And actually, I think, you know, 
whatever you think about Macron, he has actually dealt with this pretty, pretty well. well. You think yeah. that from a comms point of view he Absolutely. did well? Yes. Okay. Well, he engaged, and as, as you both said, he went to meet the people, he wasn't afraid, he didn't stay in the Elysee trying to sort it out or, or push the government in the first line, which is one of the reasons why opponents attack him so hardly today as well. That this is all about him. So That's people have forgotten the fact that he was silent in the very beginning and he disappeared and for yes, a while. So, so he's managed to, to turn it around. Absolutely. And, and he did go. He spent the first meeting was seven hours long. He was there, just in, like with his shirt, no, no jacket, talking bluntly to people and having a real direct exchange. That's the first time it happens in French democracy. Oh, really? Uh, what about the yellow, the yellow vest protesters? What do we make of them now? Esther. Well, I think the movement, and, the movement uh, has yeah, and simultaneously has become more violent and people, the public has... Well, in, it was quite peaceful, French. the last one uh, this time, but we've seen a lot of the, violence on TV. Definitely yeah. the, the, the perception of the yellow vest have changed uh, uh, in parallel, mm. in parallel with, with, with Macron has done. And let's not forget, I mean, there were reports that they were, there were people uh, preparing to escape the Elysee Palace as the, as the protest grew. So in, in that... In that uh, uh, since uh, Macron did stabilize his presidency. Now, we we'll have to see if he takes this uh, chance, takes this opportunity and uses it for the European elections. He's ahead of the polls, but if this doesn't work out you know, for him, then he could, he could lose. I want to pick up on what Thibault said when this is the first time it's happened in, in French democracy. What was the missing ingredient in the past that you see now? Engagement, direct engagement mm, with people. Okay. Sarkozy and Hollande, and Chirac was very good with that, but it wasn't the same context. Hollande and, and Sarkozy did go sometimes every now and then to go and meet people that always felt like something that was very controlled. But when you say success, success from whose point of view? Because, because the Yellow Vest protesters, uh, those that were still hardcore, they don't see, they don't believe, they, they, they don't, don't buy feel, this. No, they don't feel they'll be listened about, to. We're talking about 22,000 people. I'm not sure. saying it's to be dismissed, but sure. there were 200,000 in November, now they're 22,000. Or people just got tired. Maybe they did. Maybe okay. they also found that this debate was probably the right way to engage and express their, their views. Okay, but it was, it was, I think we should say, just finally, and I think you look at some of the failures of political leadership across Europe, <clears throat> Theresa May, in terms of like not failing to engage with actual people. Mm. I think it was Tony Blair that once said that, you know, politics is the art of debate, the art of persuasion, and that you should never stop doing that as a politician. And clearly, uh, you know, Emmanuel Macron has been able to do that, turn things around. As I said, there are others elsewhere in Europe who mm. could probably learn a few political From lessons, here. who could potentially get themselves out of a political But I think it's important to note... Change. In saying that, the, the, but you know what, the proof is in the pudding. Exactly. And, and we still come back to, yes, if it's all rhetoric, you know and what, the French... And perception, this is what's will, coming will, out of this will, discussion. ...will very easily forget about the stunt <laughs> and uh, will not be happy. So, you know, politics is ultimately not just about rhetoric, it's about actual tangible Absolutely. change. We, as as, as we all, you've all been saying, we've got to wait for whether he brings what he has promised. All right, coming up on Raw Politics, has Emmanuel Macron's nationwide debate changed your mind? Well, we want to know what you think and we'll hear from you. Your call is coming up at 7 p.m. CET after the show. The contact information is on your screen. You can call us at 00800 333 to Get in on the debate. Use the hashtag Raw Politics. Our lines are opening soon. There have been terrible mistakes made in the past. They stole from the rest of the world. The apology just might be a way of saying, right, we said sorry, now shut up. You can't apologise for all the sins and crimes of one's predecessors, you know, hundreds of years ago. Four people seem to basically run Europe. Mr Juncker, Mr Tusk, Verhofstadt and Timmermans. People don't actually know what these elections are all about. Okay, well, those were some of the highlights of our last uh, Your Call show last week. And uh, for tonight's uh, preview, uh, I'm joined by uh, MEP uh, Saj Karim and uh, also uh, Darren McCaffrey is back with us and Esther Zalad. All of them will be on Your Call tonight. So, Darren, what are we talking about uh, in Your Call? What do we want people to call in Well, about? we want you to get in touch about a whole range of subjects. As you mentioned, uh, Emmanuel Macron just before the break. Mm. Um, has his strategy changed uh, your uh, mind? Uh, but also talking about trust in politics because that's a big issue issue that is found not just in any particular country, but it's definitely a pan-European uh, subject. Uh, so let's have a look at some of the topics coming up tonight. For some of Europe's populists, the targeted May's elections are the so-called elites in Brussels. 
Italy's Matteo Salvini today launches a pan-EU populist alliance. Perché chi sta affossando il sogno europeo sono i burocrati, i buonisti e i banchieri che stanno governando l'Europa da troppo tempo. Another leader who regularly attacks the elite, Hungary's Viktor Orban. He says control of migration should be taken back from bureaucrats in Brussels. When it comes to elites versus populists, who do you trust? Back in Britain, faith in the political system has fallen to a 15-year low. That's according to a new study by the Hansard Society. It found that more than half of Brits want a strong leader who's willing to break the rules. But the Brexit standoff continues in Westminster. We're asking, have you lost faith in politicians? It was the French president's response to anti-government rioting across France. The nationwide debate was Emmanuel Macron's way of showing he was listening to the public's concerns. And after months of meetings across the country, the first round of conclusions are being released. So will the findings change anything? Has Macron's nationwide debate changed your mind? So come on, Europe, what is your view? Elites versus populists, who do you trust? Have you lost faith in politicians? And has Macron's nationwide debate changed your minds? And you know what to do? Uh, get in touch, pick up the phone. It's free. The number there on your screen, 00800 333 You can email us at warpole at euronews.com. Uh, if you're on social media, Facebook or Twitter, hashtag warpolitics. Or we'd love to see your face. Uh, get on Skype and uh, find us using raw politics. And again, interesting uh, questions here. And I think, you know, the first one, elite versus populist, whom do you trust? I mean, it's interesting. I'd, we'd love to know what you think, uh, obviously, so do call in on that. But why is it mutually exclusive as well? It's a hard choice, perhaps, for people. Elite versus populist. Yes, but I, I, I would, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a, such a binary <laughs> Sure, question. absolutely. It's a, it's not um, and also, let's look well. at the populace who actually governed, like in Greece. I mean, now Tsipras, I think we, we can say it's pretty much a, a, a came part to the, the mainstream yeah, part, part of, of the elite. elite. Exactly. I mean, uh, he signed a, a, a sort of a, a deal with, uh, with now North Macedonia that no other prime minister has done before. And he also cave into the to the demands in the in the euro crisis so I th you know all this populist rhetoric then ended up uh he ended up doing you know very much mainstream things so mm -hmm. you know and i think there are two things talk. do people lump the populist and elite actually also together or do and, and do populists make an effort to to be populist to avoid people thinking of them as the elite i mean it's all it's all jumbled up and mixed together it, it is all terribly terribly <laughs> confusing there's no doubt about that but you know um when 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 you tell a working class lad from lancashire that he's now part of the elite it's you know quite hard to swallow but who do you think but wins more trust it's interesting. I think it's an interesting no, thing. No, exactly. well, all, all I would say no. is that it, it depends what perception you come from, but clearly the use of the word... I mean, it's, this is what's interesting, is that both sides use the word elite as a term or a derogatory term mm. to slag someone off. And you, if you want to have a go, you almost call people on the right or on the left as populist. Right. So it, it's kind of a derogatory term. Uh, but the problem is that actually I think what's resonating now more throughout Europe, and you guys might differ or you guys at home might differ, is that I think actually being an elite mm. is like is not where you want to be in politics yeah and politics you are disengaged in your ivory tower it's what people think about so people very you, 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 the you, working class what we were saying you are out of touch you have no idea how the common man or woman right. is leading their lives and that's where the populists then come mm. in as you know they're coming out of a movement growing from the the grassroots levels and all the rest of it but you know, this is just pure trickery it's mm -hmm. sleight of hand tactics we, we've seen this i mean in in the Brexit campaign in the United Kingdom. This is exactly what... Sleight of hand is an interesting choice of words. Like, we'd like you to join this debate. Uh, they will all be uh, on your call uh, tonight, so call in and get in touch. All right, before we go, we have uh, one more for you. Turkey's brand-new airport costing over 7 million euros opened its doors and skies today. And this reminded us of one of our favourite raw moments from last year. In fact, the time Turkey's uh, President Erdogan jumped on a buggy to see the new airport for himself. Well, let's have another look.
I mean, whatever you think about Erdogan, he's, he is an elite. I mean, that was an empty airport. I don't know why he needed all those people. Well, he has an open, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting he crash. didn't do one uh, when, when the airport opened. <laughs> love seeing it. We have, we're on Erdogan watch. Seeing Erdogan. <laughs> we are, we are. We do love that clip, particularly some of our producers, but it's a lot of fun. Yes, it's really a lot of fun. He was driving himself. No, I think that's why he needed all those people. That's why he needed all those people. I mean, in an empty airport. There you go. <laughs> Madness. All Madness. Right. Well, we would like to hear from you all your thoughts. So again, do call in, get in touch with us on social media, use the hashtag Raw Politics, join in the conversation after the show, go on Euronews as well, and uh, use Skype. I mean, no one's uh, using Skype yet. Indeed. Right. Have a good evening, and thank you very much for watching us tonight. <laughs>